Last week, Jeremiah took the head elders, the top leaders, the religious heads, to the dump to illustrate their coming destruction. Told them he was going to be renamed the Valley of Slaughter because that's where they were all going to get slaughtered. Told them how the whole city was going to be a dump. How they'd be eating the flesh of their children and their carcasses would be food for the birds and the wild beasts. Told them it was all their fault because they were a bunch of disobedient, stubborn lawbreakers. Oh, I wonder how they liked that one. Mind you, he wasn't preaching to the choir. Now, I got to preach that that uh, chapter to church folks, 90% of you believed it. Said, hey, that was a great sermon. Really? Well, okay. Yeah. You can eat your kids. Great. But Jeremiah wasn't even giving it to the average everyday folks. See, he wasn't like he was going to the tiki bar on a Friday night when everybody's drunk, preaching to them, people getting upset at him. It isn't like he was going to one of, the, one of the marches, you know, gay pride or something like that, and telling everyone they're all going to be condemned, you know. And uh, people, you know, mock you or curse you or maybe you get into a physical altercation, but that would be about it. Jeremiah's talking to the country's most powerful, most influential, most noble, supposedly the most spiritual people. This would be like speaking to Congress, the Supreme Court, the deans of the Ivy League schools, and the popes there to boot. Just throw them all in. People who expect to be respected, the people who are used to being honored. How's this going to go over? Well, we don't have to guess. Let's just read chapter 20 and find out. So, Jeremiah chapter 20, picking up the story. When Pashur the priest, the son of Emar, Emer, who was the chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, Pashur had Jeremiah the prophet beaten, put him in the stocks, and that were at the upper Benjamite gate, which was by the house of the Lord. Pasher, the son of Imer, chief officer of the temple. The chief officer is the second in command to the high priest. Of course, the high priest is the main guy who performs the sacrifices, and he, he's the one that goes and puts the offerings in at the Holy of Holies, and he's going to God on behalf of the people. But then there's all these Levites, all part of this tribe, who all have all these roles at the temple. It's kind of a small army of folks working, very much like it is around here on a Sunday morning. You know, Pastor Rob's the guy that gets up and speaks the most, but there are all these people doing all these different things to make this Worship service all happen, you know, just this thing right here to make this thing work. There's a whole team. Sorry about that, Robert. I didn't mean to mess up the equipment. Sorry. It's, there's a whole team of people committed to the sound. and One guy's the head, but there's a whole group doing it. And we just, like I already announced earlier on, we changed the nursery head. And that ministry alone is another whole crew of workers. Someone oversees it, but, uh, but there's all these people that volunteer and do it. And all these different assignments and ministries, jobs, be organized and working together. Well, the chief officer, he was given the responsibility to maintain order at the temple, making sure all these moving parts are working together. And he also has command of the temple guard own little security staff, little, little police force, as it were. Who arrested Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane? Remember? Was it the Romans? No, it was the temple guard commanded by the high priest to go get him. And uh, the Holy of Holies, uh, think, about, think about that whole temple. What, what is most things in the temple made of? Gold, right? They got gold over everything. You know, got to kind of protect that. And then the Holy of Holies is this place where you're not supposed to go into. So all these things need to be guarded. And, and people just weren't wandering around doing whatever they wanted at the temple, you know. And, and, you know, even here, we kind of have order and structure and places you go and places you're not supposed to go. And, and uh, you know, we got our ushers and uh, they kind of help, you know, keep, keep order in the service. I don't know if you knew, realize that or not, that ushers, that's part of their job. Mostly you just thought they picked up the money and, and helped with the communion. But uh, sometimes they're, they do more than that. Sometimes they help people find seats. If it's really packed out or help with the parking lot, make sure nobody runs into anybody. Uh, you know, sometimes they help people uh, leave the service, help people find seats. But sometimes we help move them on out of the service. Maybe someone has a disruptive child. You have to ask them to go out in the foyer. 
You know, all the moms here are really good about that. But I remember one Sunday, there was this little guy, and this was when we were over in that, in that uh, service, sanctuary over there. And you remember this? He had a car, right? And he was beating it, just beating it on the pew and making all this racket. The whole service, finally, one of the ushers got up and said, uh, you know, kindly asked the mom to step out. I think it was probably Rob Much, because, you know, he's the guy that would always just take initiative to plow into people like that. And so, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, took him out. And I was very happy about that because... Uh, the, the, the hardest thing for me is to preach and uh, for people to, to hear when there's just some little one making all this noise. Um, they don't know any better. It's not their fault, but, you know, it wasn't the kid's fault, but, you know, that's why we have the nursery and, and, the, and the foyer and the TV and the sound and all that. And I'm the number one supporter, <laughs> trust me, of that nursery ministry because I can't compete with cute, laughing children. They're just better looking than me. You know, and uh, screaming hungry babies. I can't compete with them either. So uh, they're, 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 they're going to capture people's attention more than I can. So I'm very thankful for everyone who serves in that ministry. Can you imagine, though, if we had 25 toddlers and babies in here? That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Be, that would be a word for it. One of the things I told Mark when he took over the, the ushers is the job is to make sure nothing disrupts the preaching of the Word of God. That's the main thing we're trying to do here. You know the old old school preachers, they'd call you right out from the pulpit. You ever been in a service when they'd done that, you know? Well, one time with Pastor I, I worked under, there was, a, there was a screaming baby, and he just mid-sermon finally said, would one of the ushers just tell that mother to go to the nursery? <laughs> and then just waited till they finally, the mother got up and left, and they were visitors, and they never came back, big shock, you know? <laughs> but I, I didn't blame them, because, you know, it was just, you know, he, he was so obviously disruptive. So anyways, God bless Suzanne and uh, the ministry there, and God bless Jenny Pino and the work of all those women that are doing there that really helps make things smooth here for the preaching. But, uh, you know, these ushers, they do these things, right? Usher people in, usher people out. Uh, yeah, ushering people out. Back when we were in Nova Scotia, there, was a, there were a couple times that the ushers had to move drunk people out of the service. See, we used to be right in town, right on the street. And this was really the evening service. And people would kind of stagger in the evening service. And we knew they were there just to create a problem. So we'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, come on in. And we'd sit them right at the very back, that back pew. And then uh, once they jumped up to make some noise, the guys would jump up with them and just give them the bums rush and take them right on out. And uh, we miss all that drama here at Faith Bible Church. You know, we just don't have all that cool stuff happening. So ushers had to be bouncers. So, you know, Pasher, he's got, it, he's, got, he's got it up a notch beyond just ushers. He's got armed guards. You know, uh, nowadays with church shootings, people wonder, you know, should we have some armed guards? And well, they did in Bible times. And uh, there's a biblical precedent for having some armed guards around. The only problem with the chief priest at the temple, Pasher, is he didn't like what Jeremiah was prophesying. Matter of fact, nobody likes what Jeremiah is saying. It's disrupting everybody. And since it's the chief officer's job to maintain order, he goes about dealing with the disruptor. He sees as Jeremiah and he takes Jeremiah and he has him beaten and he has him put in the stocks. What does that mean to have him beaten? Well, actually, we can look at Deuteronomy chapter 25, and it's written right in the law. If there's a dispute between men and they go to the court and the judge decides the case, they will justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, and they shall be, if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, the judge will have them lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of the stripes according to his guilt. He may beat him 40 times, but no more, so that he does not beat him with many more stripes than these and your brother is not de degraded in your eyes. So that's the prescription according to the law of Moses. Beat him with the number of stripes according to his guilt. Uh, I've taken a few beatings back in the day. Uh, we don't call them beatings anymore because that sounds very abusive. But, you know, we, we say butt whippings or spankings, whatever term you like. But uh, sometimes it was with a meter stick or yardstick, whichever you prefer. Sometimes dad would use his belt, pull the belt off. Oftentimes it was just as easy to hit you with his hand. Voila! Get you with one of those. In uh, elementary school, they used a leather strap, and they'd get you on the hand. They'd just hold out your hand and then, bah, hit you on the... So I had, I had a whole mixture of all those things, you know, all kinds of flavor there. School, they would give you two swats. You'd get two on the hand. Dad would be one or three, depending on 
how he was feeling, I guess, so whatever the, the severity was. Um, 40. That's a lot. At least they had a legal limit. You know, the Romans had no limit to how many times they would whip somebody. And that's who beat Jesus when he was crucified. The Jews didn't use the same tools as the Romans either. They used a strap of leather. The Romans uh, would have a, a leather, uh, multiple pieces of leather with bone and metal in, in there that would rip into the person and tear flesh out. And uh, the Jews wouldn't beat somebody stripped. They wouldn't strip them down and beat them. The Romans did that because the Jews were doing it for punishment. And the Romans were doing it for torture. That was their whole point. So I'm not sure how many times they beat Jeremiah, but since they really upset at him, I'm betting it was more than three. I think he got more than three. And this is the problem when the people who are enforcing the laws are corrupt. Pasteur could claim, I'm just doing my job. You know, I'm the chief officer, and it's my job to keep order, and it's legal. You know, here's the law. I'm following the law of Moses. But he's wrong to do it because Jeremiah, just like Jesus, was innocent. He didn't break any laws. He was just prophesying. He was telling them what God had said, and they're doing this to him. Why? They don't like his message, Right? They want him to change his message, or they just want him to stop. And this is the problem when the people who are enforcing the laws are corrupt. When the moral police are actually immoral people. And that's kind of a problem that's going on in our culture right now, isn't it? The, nil the nihilist, the atheist, the hedonistic, the narcissist, even the Satanists are all in position of power. And now they're using these positions of power to promote their immorality as morality. To endorse their opinions and preferences as good, as ideal, as the norm. And when I say they're in positions of power, I mean they're everywhere. It's from the, the, the churches to the media outlets, from the education to the industries, from the courtrooms to the classrooms. Any position that is influential, you'll see people with the wrong ideas clamoring for the top spots, which is why we are witnessing the redefining of marriage, making moral immoral, the redefining of life, the redefining of gender, the redefining of hate and love, the redefining of facts, the rewriting of history, and the revision of scripture, all so that they can make the immoral moral, all so that they can make the evil good, all so that they can shut the truth up. I don't know about you, but I see this stuff every day. People who think they're enlightened promoting darkness. But we see right here in 600 BC that that's not a new problem. In Jeremiah's time, it was so widespread, it was so predominant that all the people with all the positions of power were guilty. Everyone received the message of condemnation from the Lord. The chief priest over the temple of the house of the Lord rejects the word of the Lord and has the prophet beaten and put into stocks. So these stocks were not just his feet or his hands and head, like many times you go to one of these uh, historical places and you get to put your head in the stocks and smile. It, it, it was much more than that. It was, it was head and hands and feet all at once. So you're sitting and you're, I, you know, some of us, Eric, you can't even bend like that, could you? You would just be done as soon as they did that to you, you know. So that's quite a strain that they're putting. After they've beaten him, they then put him in that position. And the Hebrew word for stocks means causing distor distortion. So the person is doubled over and they left him like that for how long? Overnight beaten and tortured, and he's put at the upper gate. So right at the city gate, that would be the place where the most people would see you, which was uh, um, meant to hum humiliate, because then everyone would know what happened to you. Now the gate of Benjamin, which the author goes to even tell us which gate, because about eight gates in Jerusalem that you, you could be at. The gate of Benjamin is so named because it was the gate that led the road uh, out to the territory of Benjamin. And of course, Jeremiah is from the tribe of Benjamin, which means what? This is the gate that leads home. See how those 
little details even have a meaning? What, what do you think is the intent of stalking him at that particular gate? So what I'm asking you to do right now is, is called emotional hermeneutic. Is to, is, to, is to interpret Scripture based on the feelings of a person. Hermeneutics is your method of biblical interpretation. And, and here at Faith Bible Church, some of you are visiting today, we apply a literal, historical, grammatical, consistent, biblical hermeneutic. Got all that? Right? You know what all that means? Sure. Literal it means that what it says is what it means. Historical, that it's a factual history, paying attention to the details of the people in their time in history when we interpret it. We look at the, the historical facts that are going on. Grammatical, the words make up the sentences, which make up the paragraphs, all which are conveying the ideas. And the author chose very specific words and arranged them in a particular manner to convey his ideas. And that's why often I'll tell you, this is what the Hebrew word means. This is what the Greek word means. And when we say that we want to be consistent in our hermeneutic, meaning we don't change from our literal historical grammatical approach, when we come to a passage that we don't want to take literally, like say, I don't know, the creation story in Genesis. First chapter, first verse of the Bible, you got to choose your human, you got to choose your hermeneutic right there. You have to decide, are you going to believe what it says? Because if you, it, it sure reads like God created everything in six literal days. If that's not your interpretation, your comprehension of what the author is describing, then either you have a very low reading comprehension or you're, not, you're going to apply another hermeneutic. And when you do that, you are now taking your beliefs and your theology and you're putting it into the passage. You're not taking your beliefs and your theology from the passage. People who interpret Scripture in that manner, their, their beliefs, they, they start with them. They don't start with God, not with what God says. But at Faith Bible Church, we don't start with us. We, we, what we think or feel, we start with what does the Bible say? What did Almighty God inspire the, the authors of infallible Scripture to write down? God speaking to us through His Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. It's all inspired. It's all been written down for the express purposes of conveying God's thoughts, God's heart to us. That's why you're here, is it not? To hear from the Lord. It's important to me, everyone, it's important for me every once in a while to review hermeneutics and what our hermeneutical approach is, because lots of places no longer employ a consistent biblical hermeneutic. And the average churchgoer doesn't even know what that is or why it's important. But see, my hope is, if ever, whenever God moves you on from St. Mary's County, I know you wouldn't leave this church if you were in St. Mary's County, but if you ever had to move away, you know, some faraway place that you couldn't commute back, you know, something over two, three hours away, otherwise you would come if you ever went to another church, I, I would hope that you would go to that pastor and ask him, excuse me, sir, what is your hermeneutical approach? <laughs> and I hope that that answer would help you govern whether you would stay there or not. Right? I want you to know these things. Why we preach, uh, use, practice expository preaching. Expository preaching is a form of preaching that details the meanings of a particular text or passage of Scripture. It explains what the Bible means by what it says. And that's why we take a book and we stick into it until we finish it or until Jesus comes back. And as it comes, you know, with Jeremiah, we never know which it's going to be, whether we'll finish this book or maybe Jesus will come back, whichever comes first. But at least you understand why we're doing it. It may not be trendy or slick, but it's timeless. And it's essential. Okay, so I, my question was emotional hermeneutic. <laughs> is when you take the time to try to relate what the actions of the passage is making the people feel. This is especially insightful thing to do with the narrative passages, the parts that are telling you about what people are doing. See, Jeremiah, a lot of it is prophetic, but then you have these snippets of narrative. So in this action here, what, what is it making everyone feel? You know, well, how, did the, how are the people taking Jeremiah's message of impending doom? Basically, he said, you're all trash, and that's why they beat him, and they put him in stocks, and then they put him at the gate of Benjamin, 
And what was the intent of stalking him at that particular gate? What's the intent? Think. Shame. Deeper than that. Home. Even more precise. That's the gate his mom uses. That's the gate his parents come through. I got, I got grandparents here. I got family here to see a child to celebrate, right? Because we're excited and we're proud. But right, And then you have someone and you flip that around. And here's somebody that you love and they're beaten and they're put to shame. And that's hurting you. And it's hurting your family. And it's hurting all your relatives. And they put him there at that very gate. So all of his family would feel that. And he would bring shame to everyone. You know, if, uh, if some reporter from the Washington Post watched one of my videos on YouTube and then wrote up a piece about me, you know what I would say? I don't care. Because I don't know that person and I don't write, read that, whatever that is. And uh, I could care less about that. But you know, if my dad ever, ever wrote me an email and said, you know, Rob, I listened to one of your sermons and boy, I was, I, 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 was, I was appalled at what you did there. You just did some horrible preaching. No, I would get you right there, you know. If Ileana ever said, you know, I, I, I was so embarrassed with what you did this week. You know, I'd just, ah, I'd feel really low. I was like, man, I stink at my job. And if Tony ever said, Dad, you embarrassed me using me an illustration, I'd be like, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, that's just the joy of being my kid. That's what you get. They put Jeremiah there to cause him and his family and this people the most public shame to hurt them physically and emotionally. Well, I hopefully... Jeremiah learns his lesson, right? That'll cure him from ever speaking negative prophecies against us country leaders ever again. You think? <laughs> Verse 3. The next day, Pashur released Jeremiah from the stocks, and Jeremiah said to him, Pashur is not the name the Lord has called you, but rather Megor Misabib. Oh. Megor, exactly, Norma, we'll get to it. Pashur, this name... Pashur is close to the Hebrew word cleaver or splitter, which is a pretty good name for a warrior. Isn't that a cool name for a warrior or a chief officer? You know, someone names you the cleaver. Imagery is kind of intimidating. So one of, one of our elders back in Nova Scotia, he was this no-nonsense Dutch, Dutch fella, and, and whenever we had a hard job to do, he was the guy to say, I'll do it. We had, a, we had a church house, and we had people living there, and they were renting it, and they weren't paying their rent, and this went on for months, and we are like, golly, we're going to have to evict somebody. Yeah, this is kind of awkward. And he said, I'll do it. And then we had, we had a, a staff member at our Christian school, and, and they were, there was a bunch of mess there. And we're like, I think we've got to let this gal go. And he's like, I'll do it. I'll give him the pink slip. So anytime there was a hard thing to be done, he was one of the guys that would, you know, rush the drunk people out of the service. You know, he was happy to yank them and throw them out, you know. And I nicknamed him the hammer <laughs> because he was always the one delivering the hard blows from the leadership. So it's good to have a hammer on staff. So the cleaver is a good name for someone who has to cut through the foolishness and administer punishment. It's relatively a common name in the Old Testament. There's actually about four or five cleavers, pastures. But his name is now being changed to Magor Misabib, which means dread or terror on all sides. Horror all around. As far as the eye can see, horror. And in case you don't understand what that name is conveying, Jeremiah elaborates. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm going to make a terror to make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. And while your eyes look on, they will fall by the swords of your enemies. So I will give over all Judah to the hands of the king of Babylon. And he will carry them away as exiles to Babylon, and they will slay them with the sword. And I will also give over all the wealth of this city and all the produce and all the costly things, even all the treasures of the king of Judah, I will give over to the hands of the enemies, and they will plunder them and take them away and bring them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all who live in your house will go into captivity, and you will enter Babylon, and there you will die. And there you will be buried, you and all your friends to whom you falsely prophesy. I'll make you a horror, a dread to all your friends, and you're going to see it. Basically, I'm going to make you watch as we slaughter everyone you care about. So here's what's happening. Pasher, now is Magor Misabib. He beat Jeremiah, publicly shamed him, put him in a place where all of his family and friends and neighbors could witness his pain and punishment. 
And God says, Megor Mishabib, all your family and all your friends are not going to watch you get yours. You're going to watch all who you love get exactly what Jeremiah prophesied. Now, before you think that's purely out of spite, consider this. Megor Mishabib rejected the prophecy of Jeremiah, rejected the warnings, rejected the counsel, rejected the admonitions, he tries and punishes Jeremiah as a lawbreaker and a false prophet. And as the chief officer of the temple, Magor Misabib has the power, has the influence to do something to prevent the calamity that is going to befall Jerusalem. He is in a position where he could have done something to save his family and protect his friends. Instead, he rejected and thus he leads his family and his friends to their slaughter to their doom. God says, you, you say I'm a liar, you reject my word, you're going to have to witness it for yourself. You're going to see it. So this makes me think about something. Men, women, moms, dads, grandparents, leaders in the public, leaders in the military, in industry, in education, in medicine, all of us have some position. Some level of leadership in your home, in your school, in your work, in your community. And just like the immoral are intentionally trying to gain the positions of influence so that they can impose their immorality, we all have a responsibility to not sit idly by and do nothing, or else we could end up watching the terror, the horror, the destruction of sin and godlessness sweep all that we love off into captivity. And you, Pasher, and all who live in the house will go into captivity, will enter Babylon, and there you will die, and there you will be buried, you and all your friends. So here's the application. The consequences of rejecting God's word never stays with the individual. The ramifications are broad and often generational in scope. Take the Conquer series that Tom and Michelle are offering, for example. A ministry that is there to help people overcome the sin of sexual impurity and pornography addictions. Now, Hugh Hefner, who died not that long ago, was a pioneer in the porn industry. His magazines took it mainstream. His brand normalized immorality, and it opened up the Pandora's box of horrors that is destroying lives daily. An example of how one person's sin can help destroy a nation. That follow right there. Now the flip side is also true. Because the Conquer series and the folks who are willing to join it and use it and teach it have the potential to bring healing, restoration to the individual first. But as each one reaches one, it can spread and it can be used to bring freedom and victory to many. One couple's obedience and journey of faith, forgiveness and faith can blaze a trail that can lead countless, countless out of the darkness and into the light. You just got to be brave enough to accept the truth, obey the word, and spread the good news. Jesus saves. As followers of Jesus, we are all called to spread the love, the light, the gospel of Jesus. And you can spread it with your words. You can spread it with your actions. You can spread it on social media with your little QR, whatever thing that is that you can spread it. You know, I see people spreading their supper and their puppies on social media. You, know, you could spread the gospel as well. You could do that too. You could still do the puppies too. That's okay. But... Magor Misabib rejected the word and spread the horror to all of his family and friends. What are you spreading? Lord, help us to be mindful about what we spread, that we would spread the gospel, that we would spread truth, that we would spread morality, that we would spread godly principles, that we would push back against the darkness, that we would push back against the evil, and that we would proclaim Jesus in love, I know not everyone's going to like it. Now people are going to get upset. We might take some persecution, might take some beatings. In parts of the world, people get their heads cut off. But they do it for the honor and glory of your name, Jesus. And you did it for us. You gave your life. You did not 
You did not care more about yourself than you did about us. May we follow your example. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.